Uh, hello, my name is Adam, and this is my um, video for the um, top my, my video for the top ten Newbery Award-winning novels that I have read. So, about five years ago, as a um, literature and history teacher I, in the middle school grades, I decided that it would be a good idea for me to um, read all the books that had ever won the Newbery Award Prize. And so I just started on my quest of reading all the books that have ever won the Newbery Award. And I have um, since finished that, and I have currently read all of the Newbery Award winning books. And so there are a hundred of them actually as of right now. So an exact 100 books that have won the Newbery Award. And so I'm going to talk about my 10 favorite. I thought I would make this video and um, hopefully this will be an educational video and a fun video where you can learn a little bit about my 10 favorite Newbery Award winning books. I wanna say a couple of things about this since it's been um, awarded, given, um, it's it, the the prize has been given um, to a hundred different books. Uh, I did not read any of the Newbery Honor books. That would make the list about five or six times as long. That would be well over, I think, about six hundred books, and I'm just not going to um, read that many books. And oftentimes, with the older Newbery Award winners, a lot of those um, have gone out of print. And so this book, this list is just strictly the ones that have won the Newbery Award winner. Not there will be no Newbery Award um, Honor books that will be included in this video. And the other thing that I need to say about this is everybody um, comes to this with their own um, background and their own um, enjoyment and their own um, kind of viewpoints on each of these books. So if I happen to mention some books that um, that you don't necessarily agree with, that's fine. We can we can agree to disagree. Love to hear your comments down in, um, love to hear your opinions um, down in the comments below. So please include that. These are just happen to be um, the 10 that I enjoyed the most. And as I went back, um, many of these I read um, four or five years ago when I was starting off on this journey. And so some of them I don't re remember quite as well as the ones that I've um, are more fresh in my mind. Um, like I said, this video is going to include 100, video, uh, 100 books. The first one was, I think, 1922. Um, and that was The Story of Mankind by Hendrik von Loon. And so that was the very first Newbery Award winner, and it goes up to the, um, this video will go up to the current uh, day. Um, the last book to win the Newbery Award in 2021 was a book by, written by Tay Keller. It's called When You Trap a Tiger. And so I read all of those books, and so I want to just share with you what are my 10 favorites. So um, again, I'd like to hear your, your feedback on those books, and I um, would love to hear if you'd like to ha um, have me do some more videos about the Newbery Award winning books and talk about any of those. I thought of maybe, you know, doing um, the winners for each decade and kind of giving you my ranking of each of the decades starting in the 20s and going up to modern times. So just give me some feedback if you enjoyed these videos and um, let me know what you'd like to hear for future videos about. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I don't want to make this video too long, but in case you're curious about what the, some of the books that just barely missed, um, my top 10, because again, out of the 100, we're only talking about 10. I thought I'd give you um, the ones that just that almost made the list, not quite, not going into too much detail about these other than their names, um, just because they're, um, I don't want to make the video too long. So my um, number 15 is The Giver, written by Lois Lowry. This is the one that won um, the Newbery in 1994. So great science fiction book, dystopia. Um, I think many people know this book and uh, would love reading it. So it is my number 15. Uh, my four, uh, book at one number 14, I actually don't have a physical copy of the number 14 one with me right here. It's the only one of the 15 that I'm going to mention today that I don't. It um, was the 2001 Newbery Award winner, and it is called A Year Down Yonder and written by Richard Peck. Great book, uh, funny, and um, highly recommend if you get the chance to read it. Um, number 13 is... Um, Neil Ga Gaiman, uh, The Graveyard Book. So this was the Newbery Award winner in 2009. And so um, a lot of people love Neil Gaiman. He writes books for adults as well. But this is um, a book for middle school readers and it is a very enjoyable book. So my 12th favorite Newbery is um, called Mercy Suarez Changes Gears. So this was a winner um, just a couple years ago in 2019. And so a sixth grade girl who goes to six, uh, sixth grade Hispanic girl who goes to a rich school in Florida and um, lovely story about family and overcoming obstacles. Really recommend that. And the book that just barely missed my top 10, so I won't be going into as much detail about this one as I will the other 10, is um, the 2000 um, Newbery Award winner, which is called Bud, not Buddy, written by um, Christopher Paul Curtis. 
a really good book about the Depression era and about a boy named Bud, obviously, who um, goes to find his um, long lost father. And uh, if you love jazz music or if you love uh, books about stories on the road, um, this is a great book. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the top 10 because these are my 10 favorite uh, Newbery Award winning books. Um, starting with number 10, a book that you probably all have heard before heard of before. Um, it's the 1963 Newbery Award winner. It's called A Wrinkle in Time. And so this has been made into a movie uh, uh, really recently, just a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is a book that was um, one in a series of books by uh, Madeleine Langell. I actually have not read the other books that are in the series. I've only read A Wrinkle in Time. Uh, so this is a great story. Um, Many of you guys are probably familiar with the plot. I'll give you just a brief outline of what it is. Um, the main protagonist is a girl called Meg Murray, who is 13 years old, and she has trouble fitting in with her school. And um, she um, oftentimes is criticized for maybe having a short temper and not being very focused on doing her work. Um, she has a younger brother who's five years old, um, Charles Wallace Murray, who is uh, a genius. But um, a lot of people in their community talk negatively about him because he doesn't interact with anybody outside of his family. And so um, the Murray family, um, they have a they're, they're a very smart family, all of them. And, um, you know, it's kind of the part of this book is, is, you know, how are people who are very well educated treated in a, lo a larger society? And um, the Murray, the Murray family's father is a physicist who has gone missing. And um, so the children are not sure where their father is. Uh, they have uh, these neighbors um, who are very unusual and they come and uh, meet with uh, Charles Wallace and Meg Murray. And they say that um, they know where um, their father is and they're going to help um, the Murray children find their father. And so these three mysterious strangers are um, Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch. And so these are very unusual women who have these certain powers. And I'm not going to sp spoil too much of the book because you find out later in the book what happens to them. But they are whisked away to um, other galaxies and they are able to um, go on an adventure where um, eventually what happens is Meg and, uh, oh, then they're also, um, Meg has a friend named uh, uh, Calvin, who is um, a little bit older than Meg and um, takes a liking to Meg. He's, he's maybe what you might call one of the popular boys in school. So Meg is a little surprised that Calvin wants to go along on this adventure with him. But the three of them um, go off on an adventure to find their father and they must come up, they must battle against the evil in the realm. They are taken to the planet of Kamataz where they are um, up against the very, very powerful IT or IT. I'm not sure which, what, what it is, um, how it's pronounced. Um, it's either IT or IT, but um, he, is the, he is the villain in the story. And um, Meg eventually comes to realize that she must make a, a very important decision on how she is going to try and save her family. So yeah, a really, really timeless book. I really love uh, this book and I think many of you will as well. My number nine favorite Newbery Award winner is um, the 1969 winner. Um, it's called The High King. It's written by Lloyd Alexander. This book is um, a series of books. Uh, there are five books in this series and they're known as the Prydain Chronicles. And so um, this is book five, the last of the books. And I think maybe part of the reason that this book won the Newbery Award was not necessarily that it was the best of the five books in the series, but um, it was given collectively to the series as a whole. Since this was the final book, uh, I think the Newbery Award won the um, kind of given honor or award to the, 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 the series of books as a whole. So um, actually of the five books, uh, this is the my second favorite of the five books, I would say. It's a, it's a great conclusion to the story, but uh, the second book, which is called um, The Black Cauldron, is probably my favorite of the five books. And so the book of three is the first one. Um, the Black Cauldron is book number two. Book number three is called The Castles of Lear. I might be mispronouncing that. Uh, and the book four is called Terran Wanderer and the High King is the fifth book. So these books um, Lloyd Alexander wrote um, about Welsh. Um, he was um, in World War II, he was stationed in Wales and he became an expert on Welsh mythology and Welsh um, folklore. And so these books are about that. Um, it's, it's high fantasy. Um, Taryn, the protagonist in the story, has to set out on a quest to save the world. So there is an evil um, 
force, a evil malevolent force that is trying to take control of the world. Um, and his uh, name is Arwan, and Arwan is a dark lord, and he must be defeated. And Arwan has this ability to create um, an army of evil for himself. Um, he has um, these people who are called, they're, they're like undead people who come out of a cauldron, so they're known as the cauldron born. And he creates this army of the undead that go up against um, the um, forces of good who are aligned with um, with um, Taryn in this book. Now I have to say some there's some magnificent um, um, side characters in this story. Not really side characters, but main characters who help Taryn to um, fight on the side of good. Um, and one of the things when you're you know you have five books and so you're there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of world building in this um, in these stories, but you come to know um, people like Island We the princess who's a, who's a wonderful. Um, wonderful character. And she and Taryn have a lot of banter back and forth, a lot of playful, fun banter that's in, very enjoyable to read. Um, there's a creature called Gurgi, who's a half man, half beast, um, just very, very loyal to Taryn. Wonderful, wonderful character. Um, then you've got the brave um, prince, Prince Gwydion, who helps Taryn out many times in the book. You've got um, one of the um, um, magic folk, uh, kind of a dwarfish character. His name is Doily. And so um, there's just a kind of a, a league of good guys, kind of similar to, in that sense, to the um, the stories in the Lord of the Rings, where you have a, just a group of um, good good people who are working together for a common good to save the world from being taken over by um, the um, the evil forces under working on, with Lord Erewhon. And I have to say, one of the interesting characters in this whole story, in this whole series, is, a, is one of the queens, um, one of the evil queens at the beginning of the story, Queen Ocran. Um, her her story arc is, is also very interesting in the whole plot of the Chronicles of Pridian. So I hope that you guys all read this. It's a really good series. My eighth favorite um, Newbery book, Newbery winner, is called Kira Kira. And it is the winner from 2005. So this is a story about the main character is Katie Takashima. And so she is a Japanese American who comes to, um, well, she lives in the United States with her, with her parents and her sister. Her older sister is named Lynn. So although the story starts off in Iowa initially, um, not too far into the story, they move down to Georgia where Katie's parents work in um, a poultry factory. And so um, Katie, uh, as the younger sister, um, kind of looks up to her older sister Lynn but Lynn in some ways is is um, sets a high bar for Katie to kind of live up to because I should say the author of this book is Cynthia um, Kadohata I hope I'm pronouncing that right um, no offense if I'm not um, so uh, uh, Katie looks up to her older sister Lynn and Lynn sets a high bar because Lynn's really good in school and Katie um, kind of Katie struggles in school so she feels that she's never going to measure up to her older sister Lynn. Lynn um, makes some other friends and kind of separates from Katie a little bit. They kind of go through from some spells in this book where they're both meeting new people and um, making new friends and maybe drifting apart a little bit. But then um, Lynn, starts, Lynn starts coming down with an illness and so Katie's like oh I need to spend more time with my sister. I need to take care of my sister. And maybe I need to even kind of be like more like my sister. So my parents um, will see that, um, you know, all is still well in the family unit. So there's this is a story of sisterhood, especially, but it's also a story of just um, the love of a family and how families deal with um, serious illnesses in their family and how they kind of rally together and help each other out. It's a beautifully written story, a beautifully, beautifully written story, very, very moving, very, very lovely. And um, Kira Kira is, 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 is a great, great novel. It's a, it's a great one. Um, my number seven um, Newbery Award winner is one that, again, I think you may have heard of before. It is Holes, uh, written by Lewis Sacker. Um, it is the Win Newbery winner in 1999. And so this is just almost a perfect book. Um, I have not actually seen the movie that was made from this. I heard, I've heard the movie is very good. I have not um, seen the movie, but the book is fantastic. And everybody who reads this really enjoys it. And I think it has a very high reputation for um, all the right reasons. And so this is the story of Stanley Yelnath, who um, believes that his family has a curse placed on them. And the family um, has been cursed um, since the days of his great, great grandfather, who... Um, was um, in, tr in prison for stealing a pig. And so that curse has just been um, down with the Yelnats family ever since that 
incident. And so um, the main character, Stanley, he is accused of stealing um, some shoes of a very famous baseball player. And so he didn't do it, of course, but he's wrongly imprisoned and he's sent off to um, Camp Green Lake, which is in the middle of a very vast desert in Texas, I believe. And so he is, um, this is kind of like a juvenile detention center. And when he gets to Camp Green Lake, he is forced to dig these holes that are five feet deep and five feet wide. And there's a whole bunch of other juvenile delinquents who are um, at Camp Green Lake and who are also going to dig some holes. And he, you know, he, he the book does a lovely job of um, introducing us to all these other juvenile delinquents. Again, I use the term very much tongue in cheek. Um, but um, so there's, uh, and they have wonderful nicknames that they give themselves at this camp. So there's Armpit and there's X-Ray and there's Zero. And these are all um, boys that um, Stanley meets in the book as he's um, working at Camp Green Lake. And, um, there's also a wonderful backstory in this um, about how um, there's a lady named Kissin Kate Barlow who um, lived in the area, area and she was a school teacher and she fell in love with this African-American gentleman named Sam. And this is the time um, back in the 1930s when the, when the backstory occurs, when um, people weren't uh, very sensitive about um, or thoughtful about um, people of different uh, races or ethnicities having relationships with each other. And so Sam is um, chased out of the town. And so Kate decides that she is going to go on. a. Um, she's not going to be the kind of school mom anymore. So she's going to start robbing banks and she successfully robs many banks and she builds up this treasure and then she hides this treasure. Um, nearby Camp Green Lake as the, as the lake is beginning to dry up. And so it, um, one of the reasons I love this story is, is just the plot lines come together so wonderfully. And um, when Zero and Stanley run away from camp, um, just their adventures that they have together um, out in the desert is just so, so interesting. And how um, uh, Lewis Sacker, how he um, just brings the plots together for just a perfect conclusion to the story. And again, this is almost a perfect book. Um, it is just really, really, really well written. I, I love it. Um, my number six uh, favorite Newbery uh, award-winning book is, it is a book called Upper, Up, Upper Road Slowly, and it's written by Irene Hunt. And so this is a book that's a little bit more for, one of the things about the Newbery Award winner is the Newbery um, kind of, uh, it has a range, um, you know, some of these books are intended for people who are, you know, maybe in like third or fourth grade, but then um, some of these books, and I would include Upper Road Slowly as one of those books, is more for teenagers almost. And I think this book is geared towards uh, a reader who's a little bit older. Um, I wanna say maybe, um, seventh, eighth grade, but maybe even into high school. So um, not for, not really for younger readers. Um, so this is a more mature, thoughtful book. Um, so this is a book about uh, Julie. And so Julie, um, her mother has died. And so her father doesn't think that he's able to raise her by himself. Um, and so he and her brother actually too, but the brother doesn't play very much a uh, part in the story because he quickly um, goes off to boarding school. Julie moves in with um, Aunt Cordelia and she doesn't know too much about Aunt Cordelia and she's actually a little bit nervous about um, living with her because Aunt Cordelia has always been thought of as being a very strict person and very stern and very maybe even rigid in her ways. But as Julie gets to um, know Aunt Cordelia and live with Aunt Cordelia and stay with Aunt Cordelia, she finds out that there's a, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, um, direction in Aunt Cordelia's life and Aunt Cordelia has some simple truths that she holds to and she you know she she um she loves Julie for who she is and she um appreciates you know everything about Julie and there's also an interesting side story in this and so um Aunt Cordelia has a brother whose name is Uncle Haskell and he lives in the house behind where Aunt Cordelia and Julie live and so Uncle Haskell um has a little bit of a drinking problem and so how people um, deal with persons who are broken in a way, um, a person who is an addiction, has an addiction to alcohol, is just, I think, handled with a, a lot of um, skillfulness and a lot of care. And so even though he is somebody who, um, you know, has, has, has struggles, 
Um, that doesn't mean that he's not part of the family. That doesn't mean that, you know, we should accept him for who he is. And so Julie learns a lot in this book. She grows up. Um, there's a little bit of romance in this story, um, a little bit of, you know, heartbreak. Um, also, there's, you know, some characters in the story who do die. So there's a little bit of sadness in the book, too. But it's really um, told in a very beautiful and um, interesting way, I think. And um, it's a lovely book. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a slow book, though, too. So um, I'm not sure that everybody would love this book, but um, I certainly did. One thing that I should, guess I should take a couple of minutes to say is I read all these books um, as an adult. I didn't read any of these books as I was growing up. And so um, I'm coming to all these Newbery Award winners through the eyes of an adult as, an, uh, uh, you know, from an adult's perspective. So I think reading them as um, as a child or as a teenager, um, you would probably have a, a big, um, it, it would impact you differently because, it, you know, obviously we go through different things and we, we filter things through our experiences. And so I think it has a lot to do with, um, you know, your your reaction to these books. Um, moving on, so we're into the top five now. My fifth favorite Newbery Award winner is a 2010 book called When You Reach Me. It's written by Rebecca Steed. Uh, this is a really great book, and it's it's pretty short, too. You can read it in just a couple of days if, if you don't read it in one sitting. Um, the plot is just fantastic and um, just really well crafted. It's kind of a little bit tricky to say what this book is about. It's, it's about several things. It's about friends, friendships. It's about growing up in New York City back in the 1970s when the story is set. It's about independence. It's about, um, you know, trusting your friends that they're going to do what's right. Um, it's just a really well plotted book. Um, the main character's name is Miranda Sinclair. She's a sixth grade student. She lives with her mom in New York City. So her best friend is, um, is Sal. I think that's right. Yep. And um, Miranda receives a note um, which says that um, somebody's going to be coming to save her life. And so, um, no, 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 not to save necessarily, excuse me, not to save Miranda's life, but to save somebody's life. So she receives these notes and says, you know, if you want to save, make sure that you, I, I need your help. I need you to help me. Um, and so Miranda has to help this person who is um, sending her these notes and she doesn't know who this, who, the, who, the, who these, um, the notes are coming from. Eventually, of course, she figures it out and her friends give her a lot of assistance. Uh, Further complicating matters is, is that um, her best friend, um, Sal, is punched in the stomach by a person named Marcus. And then so Sal stops being friends with Miranda for a while because he thinks that Miranda um, somehow is involved in the fact that he got punched in the stomach by Marcus. And so there's a little bit of, you know, when your best friend goes away, how do you react to that? Do you make new friends or do you try and reconcile with your best friend? Um, Miranda's mom is also trying to get on the $20,000 pyramid, so she's um, kind of preoccupied with that. Again, this is just a really, really fun book, um, and I just really like how... Um, a couple of things I want to say about this is there's a little bit of the element of time travel in this story, which is kind of a fun um, a fun subplot. And then also another thing is, is the, um, the character Miranda. She's really influenced, and she thinks about... Um, Meg Murray from A Wrinkle in Time. So I just love the, uh, the idea that, that, that the main character in this story has been influenced by another main character in, um, in literature. And so I just think that's a, a, a great little um, addition to the story. It's just, it's a really fun story. It's a really easy, easy read and the characters are really engaging and lovable. My fourth favorite Newbery Award winning book is um, from 1995. It is called Walk Two Moons. It is by uh, Sharon Creech. This is just a, a really, really well-written story. Um, so, um, and it's, it deals with some tough issues, but it deals with them in a very um, thoughtful, mature, um, loving, and not too heavy way. I just, um, Sharon Creech has a really deft touch about how she handles the subject matter that's brought up in this book, but it's just a really well-written story. So the main character is um, Sal Monica, or Sal for short. She's 13 years old. And so she is um, driving across country with her grandparents. They're going to Idaho to meet up with her mother. So Sal is, um, lives with her father and um, her mother is, um, hasn't, she hasn't seen her mother in a while. Her mother um, needed to move out so she could take care of her some personal issues. Um, but Sal is going to be reunited with her mother. And as she's driving cross country with her grandparents, she is telling them, you know, she wants to entertain them as they're driving out because it's a long, it's a long ways. I think they're driving from Tennessee, if I remember right, out to Idaho. 
And so she tells them the story of her best friend. Uh, her name is Phoebe Winterbottom. And Phoebe also, um, her mother also has left the home, for, but for a very different reason than Sal's mother left the home. And so um, Sal is telling the story of what happened between Phoebe, her best friend, and her mother. And that story is very interesting in itself. But then as um, Sal gets closer and closer to her destination, she begins to see that, um, you know, maybe her um, reunion with her mother is not going to be what she thought it was going to be. And then her grandparents um, have some things that they need to deal with as they're going out um, west as well. So again, a lovely story, beautifully written. I really, really recommend it. As I do all these books we're talking about, there's none here that I wouldn't recommend because these are my 10 favorites. Okay, we're almost uh, to the end here. We're um, only got three more to go. The third best Newbery award-winning book that I've read is called Johnny Tremaine. It's an old one. It was written in 1944. really stands up, though. Um, it's written by a lady named Esther Forbes. It's a great story. Um, a really, really wonderful uh, Newbery Award winner. So it's set in Revolutionary War times. Uh, so right before the Revolutionary War started. So the main character, of course, is Johnny, Johnny Tremaine. And so he um, is a person who is an apprentice in a silversmith shop. And so he is very, very talented at silversmithing, maybe even a little bit arrogant about his abilities. And so... Um, he works for um, a master silversmith named Mr. Laffam. Laffam, I think that's right. L-A-P-H-A-M, Laffam. And so, and actually, it's even been rumored that one day he'll take over Mr. Laffam's shop because Mr. Laffam doesn't have a son to pass down his shop to. And that he will marry um, Mr. Laffam's daughter, whose name is Priscilla, but she goes by Celia in the story. And so... Um, Johnny is um, injured in a silversmithing accident. Um, so one of the other um, apprentices that works in the shop doesn't like Johnny. Um, he's not as he's not as a, a talented worker, and he's a little bit jealous of Johnny getting so much attention and so much acclaim. And so he purposely um, ruins a, 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 a chalice, and so Johnny pours molten um, lead into that um, chalice when he's um, interestingly making it for uh, John Hancock. Of course, a real person in, revolution, uh, in um, this time period, um, right before the Revolutionary War started. And um, Johnny burns his hand, and so he becomes disfigured, and he can never um, be a silversmith because of his badly burned hand. He won't be able to, um, he won't be able to um, use, it, use the tools correctly. And so Johnny now has to set about rebuilding his life. And so how does he rebuild his life? Um, and, he, you know, all the Revolutionary War politics that are happening are... Um, part of this book. Um, Johnny befriends a, a boy named Rab who loves him for who he is, not what his body or his hand looks like. And so um, Rab becomes a good friend and Rab gets involved with the patriots who are thinking of rebelling against the British colonial rule. Esther Forbes um, knows her time period really, really well and she interweaves um, real historical figures such as James Otis and Paul Revere, um, into the, and Josiah Warren into the story and makes a fictional story um, have a lot of, um, of a historical setting. Of course, as a history teacher, I just love that aspect of it. And Johnny is a really interesting character. I have to say that uh, Celia is a wonderful character. Um, there's an interesting subplot that goes on with Celia's younger sister and um, another wealthy family in um, the Boston area. And um, as we get closer and closer to the wartime, um, the stakes get higher and higher. Um, I'm not going to spoil it, but it, it is a wonderful read. And just a little sidebar, there was an early episode of The Simpsons where uh, Bart Simpson had to read this book as part of his book report that he was doing for school. And as you know anything about The Simpsons, Bart Simpson, not really necessarily a um, stellar student, but in that episode, he even loved the book Johnny Tremaine. And so if that's not a high enough endorsement for you, I don't know what is. Okay, two more to go. Um, number two is my second favorite uh, Newbery Award winner is called Rifles for Weighty. Um, this is written by Harold Keith. This was the Newbery Award winner in 1958. And so we go from a Revolutionary War story being my number three to a Civil War story being my number two. So this is a story um, set in um, Kansas and Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, during the Civil War, so the Western theater of the war. And this is kind of one of the reasons I like this book is it tells a part of the Civil War that maybe isn't as well known, and that is how the Civil War impacted the Native American tribes living in the West. Um, again, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, North Texas, that area. And so um, the main character is a man named Jeff 
Bussey. And so he uh, lives in Kansas and he um, his family is attacked early in the book by a bunch of Southern bushwhackers. And so he decides that he's going to join the army to protect his family and, and to protect the people of Kansas from being bushwhacked by these um, by these Southern bushwhackers. And so um, Jeff is off to um, fight in the war and he's full of, you know, vigor and enthusiasm for the war, you know, um, being in the war will be the right thing to do. Um, people will be brave at all times and they will act honorably at all times. Well, once he gets started and, and is in some engagements and he meets with other people in the Union Army, he finds out that not everybody is um, noble and honorable and does the right thing. Um, there are some um, cowards and there are some people who are selfish and who are only out to, for themselves or their own self-preservation. So on, and on both sides, um, he sees the good and the bad. Um, part of the story is involved. He becomes a spy for the Union, um, but he, part of his spying means that he has to go down and pretend to be um, a Confederate soldier. And so he actually spends a lot of time in the story um, around the, the Confederate Army. And also, again, this is out in the Western theater, so he spends a lot of time in the story um, with... Uh, with the, with the um, Native American people. And he especially meets um, a family, uh, the Washburn family. And they have a daughter named Lucy who is his age and is um, very headstrong and beautiful. And Jeff actually falls in love with Lucy during the story. And so then he worries since he's a Union soldier and that she's um, uh, a person who supports the Confederate cause because her brother Lee Washburn is fighting um, with Stan Waitie rifles for weighty, um, Stan Weighty and his um, Confederate um, soldiers. Uh, uh, one of the main subplots in the story is um, one of Jeff's commanders is an uh, extremely um, brutal man. His name is um, Captain Asa Clarity, and Captain Clarity, it's eventually found out, is trying to, um, even though he's a Union soldier, he's trying to smuggle um, rifles to um, uh, the Confederates and sell them to the Confederates. And these rifles are um, rifles that are repeating rifles and can fire a lot faster and will help the Confederates win the war. So Jeff knows, finds out about this information, but because he's um, stranded in the South, it's difficult for him to um, get the information to the people who need to hear it. And so uh, it's a really well written book, very um, uh, apt conclusion to the story. And um, I love it. But my favorite of all the Newbery Award winners, the best out of the hundred that I have read is from 1962. It is called The Bronze Bow. It is um, written by Elizabeth George Spear. And so this book is set in the time of Christ in um, ancient Israel. And so the main character is a, boy, a young boy named Daniel. And Daniel is a Jew who has come to hate the Romans. And the reason that he has is because his father and his uncle were killed by the Romans. Um, so his uncle was thrown in jail for theft and um, Daniel's father tried to um, break his brother out of jail. The Romans caught him and they executed both Daniel's uncle and his brother. And so Daniel is orphaned and brought up with a lot of hostility um, against the, the Romans. And so he's vowed that he's going to get back at the Romans. He has a sister and a grandmother that he lives with. His mother died of illness, by the way. Um, he has a sister and a grandmother that he lives with, and he feels responsible for caring for them. Um, but also, he the hatred in his heart for the Romans um, wants him to leave the city, which he does, uh, and he goes out to live with a man um, whose name is Rosh. And Rosh is kind of like... A, I guess you would say a vigilante or a freedom fighter. And so he's recruiting um, people from the community to come out and live in the countryside where they're a little bit safer because they can hide in the hills and train an army of Jews to overthrow the Romans. And again, this is set at the time period of Christ. And so we're also meeting some people who are finding out that Jesus has a different way of um, viewing the world and then through the hostility of the Jews who are trying to uh, throw off um, the Roman rule in Jerusalem and in all of Israel. Uh, another important thing I think I need to mention that there's another important uh, group of characters in the story and they are um, uh, twins, brother and sister twins, and um, their name is Jacob and, um, let me make sure that I'm getting that right. Oh, no, excuse me, Joel. It, uh, 
set of twins, Joel and Thasia, and so a boy and a girl. And they live in Jerusalem, and Joel is being trained to um, be a rabbi in the community um, and respect the, the law. And so, but Joel um, makes friends with Daniel, and so then he's kind of torn about what he wants to follow. Does he want to follow Daniel's lead and maybe join Rosh in his party, or does Joel want to continue to study the scriptures and become a respected person in the community? And so, and then Thasia becomes friends with um, with um, uh, Daniel's sister. Uh, um, I forgot her name. Uh, I think. It, um, Esther. I want to say Esther is the sister's name. Anyway, Stacy becomes friends with uh, Daniel's sister, and so they need to decide what they're going to do. Really moving story, really um, well-written story. Um, the fact that I'm a Christian, I think, influences the way that I read this story, but it's just, um, I just love this story. It's the favorite of my, um, my Newbery Award winners. Okay, so let me know what you think about um, this video. And if you'd like me to um, make other videos about the Newberries that I've, um, I've read, then I would be glad to do that. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope that you um, will check out some of my other videos. Thanks for your attention.